hypnosis. Think of, you know, the, the shyster on a stage that's telling you, oh, you know, you're a dog and then they make you bark like a dog. Hey guys, welcome to ASCC. Today, we are so mm -hmm. pumped to welcome the unstoppable Blanca Luna Ainsworth. She's the powerhouse behind the Your Health is Your Wealth YouTube channel. So let's buckle up as we explore Blanca's incredible journey from culinary maven to financial whiz to health revolution igniter. Guys, welcome, Blanca, welcome today. Thank you, you look beautiful. Thank you, Bettina, and thank you for having me as your guest today. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy you're here. You know, I love visiting with my friends. It makes it so much more fun. And the fact that you're one of my ultra friends makes it even more special. Let me ask you, where in the world is Blanca today? Blanca is actually um, in her own home. She's not traveling abroad. Uh, I know I do post that I travel a lot. Um, I'm actually where I record my own podcast. So it's, it's my office and um, I, that's where I am today, sitting with you. <laughs> sitting with me. I love that. So tell me how you went from culinary to finance and to health. Like, how did that journey, tell us all about your journey. Sure. So, so I've always been passionate about health and wellness, um, as well as cooking and the culinary arts. Um, I, in a, a different version of my life, um, did co-own a restaurant. And I also founded an artisan food line um, that uh, was very complimentary to the restaurant. I used to vend at farmer's markets and the product was also in local grocery stores. And the whole concept was about making uh, for the artisan food line was making um, food that was readily accessible, already made convenient, if you will, that was um, fresh. It wasn't processed. And uh, with that, I was part of the farm to table movement as I was part of farmers markets. That really was the concept of just eating locally, um, eating fresh, um, really being aware of what you put into your body. And for me, that was also very complimentary because I am a very avid runner. I love the great outdoors. I um, love uh, being just physically active. So for me, what I put into my body was important because um, I was starting to race marathons at the time and my performance really mattered. So I just became very in tune with um, my diet, what I put into my body, my physical activity. And I'm always on a journey to learn because I know I can always improve on what I'm doing. So yeah. that's how I started in the culinary arts and in when the restaurant was that? industry. When was so, that? So um, that was in 2006 is when the restaurant was started. It was called Good Karma Restaurant in Park City, Utah. And that has ceased to exist. The artisan food line I founded was called Instant Karma. So it was a play on the restaurant. We had good I karma love that. And had instant karma. <laughs> oh, that's fun. And it's and that also works as like what you put into your body. It does come back to you. That's like that's karma in itself. You started running. When did you start running your marathons? So, so marathoning, I started about two decades ago. Um, I, I've been running since I was in high school. I was on the track team and um, I wasn't very good at it, but I picked up the love of running and it's something that sustained me through college. And then um, little by little, I started doing little races like a 5K here, a 10K there. And then, you know, eventually it grew into marathons. Um, my first marathon was um, after I birth had birthed my second child. Um, I just started setting fitness goals for myself. And, uh, you know, that was something so elusive to me, running a marathon. So um, I, I ran my first marathon um, wow. well over two decades ago. So what is a marathon exactly? Tell me. So a marathon is the length is 26.2 miles. So it's a singular event. Um, and there's many runners of all, all sorts of levels um, and running abilities. And it, it's just... I consider it um, self-improvement, the challenges you go through, the training, the doing something hard, the consistency, 
the persistence. Um, I love it because I think it's such a metaphor for so many things in life. You know, setting the goal, right. doing the training, putting the rest in, and then showing up to the event and having fun because, you know, you're ready. <laughs> so I hear it hurts. Like, like physically, it like it's painful. How do you get past that? I'm just curious now. You know, Bettina, I love that question because it, it's not a simple answer. And I would say I, I've done several marathons, more than I can count on my two hands. And for me, every marathon has been different. And the pain associated with each individual marathon is different. And yeah. um, I, I guess I could say um, every time I do a marathon, it's a different experience. And for example, I'll just refer to the last marathon I did which was in Bordeaux, France, last September, 2023. Um, it was my bucket list marathon. And it's a <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, and it's a costumed marathon. Um, every year they change the theme. So, I remember. So, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. So, and I had had this marathon as part of my um, bucket list for, um, quite honestly, um, over 15 years. And so... How I got myself mentally ready for that marathon is I had had um, a family tragedy. Um, it spanned over several years. And when I went back to look at photos of myself, I saw that I was never smiling in any photos. I mean, again, this spanned over several years. I had just lost, um, you know, um, vitality and zest for life. So at that point, my goal became to just find my smile again. And, and to me, that is why I set the goal of that marathon. And so for me, the pain that I was experiencing physically of training for the marathon was so much less than the emotional and psychological pain I was experiencing from our family loss, our tragedy. My 13 year old stepson um, died in a very, very, um, tragic way and it was actually a very um socially public death it was in the news media um it, it actually still is for uh, lots of collateral events that have taken place but again to address your question and i know I, i'm being a, a little long-winded um i love it for me for, it was long-winded like go in the all the <laughs> thank you for being long-winded yeah, you know, for me, it, it was a pain of my own choosing. Um, I was choosing the pain of training for the marathon, of, of that physical hurt. And because I didn't have control over the emotional, psychological hurt of ex external events, I felt for me, it was a way of reclaiming my life. It was a hurt of my own choosing. I've talked to so many other long distance runners um, and again, it's not a universal truth for all runners, but um, many runners that do do endurance sports, you know, the more you talk to them on a personal level, you find out that they've had some sort of traumatic event or experience and running really does become an outlet. Allows you to feel the feel. I will try to uh, explain it a little deeper. Um, when you dissociate or you are so numb, you really don't feel your own body. You're not present. So yeah. for me, Training for marathon, you have to be completely present. You you have to be there. And not that it's not a meditative experience at some point, because for me, that really is what running is. It's my best form of meditation. You know, my, my mind yeah. gets very creative and I go different places. But um, what it really, the benefit it had is it, it made me be um, in the moment and be completely present. How has that played out over the last few years? Because I, I know you've been running for since high school, but this one really impacted you uh, and allowed you to be more present. Absolutely, and I think every marathon helps make me feel present because it's, it's, it's a journey, it's not a singular event, you know, the entire training to lead up to the event, but there's so much that goes into just prepping for it. So um, it gets you in a state to just be more present. So yes, it, it definitely helped just feel reconnected and ha and find my zest for life again. I, I found my smile and that's really yes. what I was after. And your smile I, I is so beautiful. Yes. Oh, I, and I've seen thank it you. and I can't, it, cause I haven't known you that long, maybe a year, a, a, a touch over a year. And I, to think of Blanca as not having that beautiful smile as her 
constant accessory. I can't imagine. To, and to know how you have come through that, right, probably allows you to really help other people on their journeys as well. Like so many people don't go through anything and they don't know how to, to help somebody overcome it. It's like my husband, I think he's a phenomenal soccer coach, skills coach. And they're like, oh, he's such a natural. No, he worked really hard at it. That's why he's so good at teaching it. But so many of the friends that we know that are just naturally gifted, God talented people, when we're like, they're like, you got to do a special skill that requires a physical, like jumping or running or something. They're like, just, just run, just go. Why can't you do, why can't you do that? Because it's just naturally to them. They didn't have to learn how to overcome something. And you, from listening to you, I have learned you have overcome so much. How do you use that overcoming experience to help others? That is such a great question, Bettina. And I love that you asked it because I did find myself very alone and lonely on my path to healing, it was not straightforward. I um, pretty much experimented with so many healing modalities to, to find what was going to work for me. And it was a lot of trial and error. And it's not like there's some guidebook out there that you check off, say, okay, did that one. Okay, that worked. Okay, did that one. That worked. Yeah. And, and so it wasn't um, a, a, a just progressive a sequential healing process. Um, there was some steps forward and some steps back. Um, and with everything I tried, I really wanted to not have others struggle as much I did as I did with even just the conversations about pain and loss and, and hurt, um, the seeking of um, mental health, which it's not as stigmatized as it used to be, but it's still very stigmatized. People don't like to talk about it because they internalize it that, oh, what will people think about me? Um, oh my gosh, what will they say? How will they look at me? Th there's still so much stigma around asking for help. Right. So how does somebody have that conversation? Like, so you're leading it. What are you finding is the common common theme that really resonates with your followers that's growing fast. You've got a big following that's really grown fast. There's a need for this. My journey to start this YouTube channel had so many different um, paths that led me to where I finally landed. And at the time, um, be before I even started the YouTube channel or even the idea of it. I was in the financial services industry, which you asked me about, you know, mm -hmm. how my journey led me to the culinary world, to then the financial service industry, yes. um, to where I am now. So I was helping individuals uh, with financial planning and um, specifically with life insurance so that they could protect their loved ones um, where they no longer there um, to, to take care of them themselves. And one of the biggest obstacles I found is that um, so many prospects that I was trying to help and clients um, had very compromised health situations. So they could not qualify for life insurance as oh. much as they wanted it. As I'm helping um, educate my audience, I'm also learning how I can improve my health because I always want to be the, the best, healthiest version of me. Of right. Life. So, you know, it's interesting. You said they gave up hope. And I think that is, that is the saddest state to be in. Cause once you have, I, as long as you have hope, I feel like there's an opportunity to accomplish anything. How do you help somebody regain hope? You know, I would really say one of the biggest steps is you can't be an island unto yourself. You need other people. We are social creatures. And for me, um, I know with the shutdowns, um, I developed social anxiety as many of us did once, um, you know, the, the world started opening because we hadn't been around people. And here I was now with this, um, bucket list marathon on my calendar, you know, um, six months out. And what I did to help me not only with, with my um, 
sense of anxiety of being around other people. It's like, well, oh my gosh, I've been running by, by myself and only by myself. Um, I am so nervous about showing up to a starting line with thousands of people to run this event. So one thing I proactively did is I joined several running groups. Mm -hmm. um, it helped me socialize with like-minded individuals um, that cared about their health and wellness, that were willing to get together with other individuals to work on it as a community and a tribe. And, and um, just um, probably also had several of the same anxieties I did. It's like, oh my gosh, I haven't been around people for two years. This is going to be kind of weird. So I think we were just all willing to be awkward together because we had these higher goals for ourselves of running events. Um, most of the people in the running groups I'm in do do marathons, ultras, 10Ks. Um, right. They're active in, in the running community and the running event community. Yeah. So I think for me, it, it's looking for your tribe, finding community. Don't be an island unto yourself. Um, that just perpetuates loneliness. So where would you like to see? And like, if you were going to look like five years down the road, what would you have accomplished by then? I actually had that conversation with my fairy godmother two weeks ago. Um, and my fairy, fairy godmother like was living in my head. And I asked myself, okay, Blanca, now that you've been doing this YouTube channel um, for six months, are you accomplishing what you thought you would? And my five-year future self and the fairy godmother I speak to then would say, yes, um, I was completely petrified to start my YouTube channel because um, I don't like being on camera. And I know that's like, well, what? You have a YouTube channel? <laughs> I remember like this, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think for me, the fear of um, it's out there and, you know, once I'm out there, I can't get the horse back into the barn. For me, that was a fear that um, I had, I still have, and I do it anyway. So um, my five-year self would even say, okay, great, you overcame your own fear of doing something that is not in your comfort zone. And because you did that, people watched you. And that gave them permission to do things they're uncomfortable with, mm -hmm. that they're afraid of, and they did it anyway. Um, my fairy godmother is also going to tell me, hey, Blanca, that book that you were working on, that you got published, it helped a lot of people. So, you know, it's awesome that you did that. So that that is where my future self will be. I do have a book in the works. Um, I connected with one of our mutual friends, um, a, an ultra member, Ashley Mansour, who mm -hmm. is um, a, a, a book um, publisher as well as a mindset coach and a writing coach. And um, she is part of my journey. I am working on a book, which I can't talk about too much right now because it's still in the germination phase. And um, I'm going to honor that baby. <laughs> um, but, but again, um, as with the YouTube channel, um, the book is also something that I really envision helping so many people with a message that needs to get out there. I, I truly want to put good out into the world. I want to help people. And that is a legacy I want to create. And right now my vehicles for doing that are Your Health is Your Greatest Wealth YouTube channel and um, the book that I am now working on. So what are some things that you've learned in as you've interviewed people on your podcast that you're like, oh, dude, that was, I learned a lot here. What are some things that you've learned that you can share? You know, some of my guests really have surprised me. And I was a little uncomfortable with some of the topics because they were topics that were raw to me. And I wasn't in the space yet to talk about it, but these guests were brave enough to talk about it from their firsthand experience. So that helped me get more comfortable with the topic. And it made me shift my brain and my thoughts and my patterns about, you know what, my YouTube channel isn't just about things I already know or that I'm comfortable with or that I agree with. Because yeah. if I only ever had those guests, then how am I growing? How am I helping others grow? So I realized I, I have to take on topics and talk to guests. Um, that um they're very difficult conversations and again sometimes i may not even agree um with their opinion but i think um that's part of the growth process and so, uh, some of the comments guests have made 
Relief made me change um, my perception of how I thought of things. So I feel like I'm doing mindset work um, right. while I'm having fun. Well, give me some um, examples. Yeah, give me some examples. <laughs> um, so, well, this one's not an uncomfortable um, conversation, but it's a conversation of a guest I just had in the episode just aired. And it's an individual that does music therapy. She's actually a therapist mm -hmm. and her license is in music. And she started talking about, um, we talked talk about trauma. Again, um, somehow a lot of my YouTube episodes always go back to trauma. And I know when I was navigating my own journey, um, I tried hypnotherapy and that's what worked for me because um, a lot of the things I was dealing with were self-subconscious. I didn't even know what I was dealing with. And that's what hypnotherapy um, yeah. helps you with to, to deal with the unconscious subconscious versus um, talk therapy where it's, you already know what the problem is and you're just talking about it. So, right. so um, I never knew there was such a thing as, as a music therapy as a modality. So when I came across this individual um, through a networking group that I, I am part of, um, I was just so intrigued. I asked her for her business card and the more we, we started talking, she started talking about how brain, um, the brain, um, like there's certain parts that you can't access um, through your verbal um receptors when you're traumatized but music reaches that part of the brain when language can't so that's why talk therapy isn't as effective but somehow the music releases a different part of the brain where individuals can navigate that trauma and i had no idea and they use um music therapy for things like physical therapy um yeah. for, for neur neural therapy individuals that have had strokes that can't talk she was saying how the music helps them, like they can sing words even if they can't talk words. So I thought that was so interesting. Um, she uh, says she works with neurodivergent individuals, especially children with autism, and that she sees this transformation of these individuals that um, are nonverbal, but they make music. It's very experiential. They actually utilize the instruments. So using the instrument as a form of expression when there's nothing verbal but but they they're still creating i thought all of that was amazing i i mean it and, is and you know what she says the individuals have fun with therapy they look forward to it. it's like well that's kind of a novel idea therapy <laughs> has fun. You know, because most people dread therapy and they feel stigmatized by needing therapy and it's like well gosh if you had me play on a bongo <laughs> yes that sounds <laughs> And it's like, when can we do therapy next? You know, it's, it's like, so I, I just think the whole idea of um, uh, not stigmatizing what you need help with, but making it fun would make more people look forward to it. Yeah, this is really helping me. And I'm, I'm having fun while I look, um, while I get the help. So again, for me, it just kind of changed my concept of, oh, you know what? Therapy can be fun. <laughs> it can be. Yeah. Well, if you think about it, like with kids, they do play therapy right? And then something happens just because I guess we humans become more disciplined or I guess polite and we tolerate more. They take the play out. But as we know, you know, gamifying things, we get better results if we'll learn to gamify. And I'm, it sounds like this is true in therapy as well, is she found a way to gamify it, to make it fun, to make it enjoyable for that it, it, lets down the guard in your brain so that you can get the better results. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, so you really enjoyed hypnotherapy. You got I great did. results from that. What is what exactly is hypnotherapy? I'll start by saying it's very little understood. And um, I know it's changing now. And most people who think of hypnosis think of you know the the shyster on a stage that's telling you oh you know you're a dog and then they make you bark like a dog that is not what it is at all so <laughs> hypnotherapy is honestly like a state of meditation like you know sometimes this is such a great example um when you're driving sometimes you know what um you're there at your destination before you even know it you got home you were wandering that is like a a state of hypnosis you drove yourself from work back to your home and, and you know what like in that entire process like you weren't even really aware of it you just arrived to your destination before you even knew right. that is absolutely a, a um 
a mode of hypnotherapy. So in a clinical in that time session, when I'm in the car on the highway and I completely zoned out and then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, I'm here. Right. And you still go to the destination. You just didn't remember how you got there. And so when it's um, done with a qualified individual, a licensed hypnotherapist, a certified hypnotherapist, there's um, different levels out there and I won't get into that, but it's just really someone that can help you um, navigate um, those um, repressed emotions, repressed memories, um, help you um, just go back to, um, a feeling, um, and, you know, how do you reframe and really just anchor in, um, positive feelings. Again, it's very different than talk therapy. You're not reliving the trauma by talking about it, but you are talking about like feelings. How did that make you feel? What, what would your, um, uh, future self go back and tell your younger self? So it just really helps you reframe how you think about what happened. And um, therein lies, I, I guess, um, the secret sauce, you're reframing an experience that happened. And um, because you have no control to change what actually happened, you are getting control about how you reframe it for yourself. Yeah. And, and um, changing the meaning of that experience. So, so it triggers you differently. Yeah, that sounds very, uh, that's neuro-linguistic programming. Correct. Yes. 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 Okay. They call it NLP. Um, and um, yes, just the, um, it's linguistic because it is how you tell yourself and it's neural because it does help um, the neurons and the synapses um, just change. And um, I, I know my hypnotherapist, um, she integrated other modal modalities, including um, the tapping you know, yes. Nick and Jessica Ortner do that, but it is very much um, a lot of somatic experiences as well because it connects the body and the mind. So I'm a big fan of empowering folks, right? Instead of the victim. And, and you know, when you're a victim, somebody says this, and then, so that's what it, it must be. So the power is coming from within. So well, there's a lot of folks and you know this, they go through, and, and you've done a lot of studying and of different modalities and you, you meet folks along the way they something happens right and one of my new quotes my quote of the week last week right was 10 percent is what happens 90 percent is how you react and um through everything that you've learned there's some folks that they get that 10 percent and then 90 per, the way they react it dominoes into one way versus another way right into they can take that and make and turn it into a positive to, you know, let's do a little pit bull here, turning a negative to a positive while other people will take that negative and they'll just go down a hole, right? From what you have learned, how do you turn, what is the best way that somebody can discover or maybe not discover, but can get their mindset to that point where it does turn into that negative to a positive? So my answer to that would be, and it's something I had to learn for myself, is that I really need to have a lot of compassion for myself. I've always had empathy for others, but I never really gave myself that same state of grace of just being nice to myself. You, you know, I was so judgmental about me and my own healing, which, you know, feeds in into other cycles, the, the limited self-talk, the, the self-deprecation. And yeah. I think understanding that, hey, you know what, you went through something. Um, now it's your responsibility to find the tools that are going to help you get better. Not waiting on someone else to do it for me, but me doing it for me because um, I needed to implement the change. No, nobody can, nobody can do it your own. Um, your spiritual work for you same like nobody can do yeah. your push-ups for you you, you got to put the time in the gym <laughs> you know you got to you got to do it so so you basically so it sounds like you just reset your self expectations and your expectations on others um yes um but there's so many other layers that go into it and, and you know what you said with the uh, 10 percent and the 90 percent and part of it is um uh what happens to you and part of it is your reaction 
How I also like to think about it is, you know, sometimes what happens to you, which is why most people end up having health issues, whether it's physical or mental, um, a lot of it is what happens to you, but the trauma, it really comes from what happens inside you. Mm -hmm. And that's the part you need to heal, what's happening inside you. That's actually the definition of trauma. L lots of people um, have um, experiences that um, are traumatic. That does not mean you're traumatized. Uh, They're two okay. completely different things. Having a traumatic experience does not necessarily mean you're going to be traumatized. So how, so does, me, how does some people get traumatized? from that event and some don't get traumatized. What is the differential there? And again, I'm not an expert in your on the opinion. field of psychology, in but from the studies I've done is, you know, traumatization is what happens inside of you. It's internal, whether um, it was self-imposed or internalized because um, you adopted it from other people um, that, um, for lack of a better word, um, implanted it on you because there are um, social processes that do contribute to, to um, trauma. Um, so okay. I would just still say, you know what? Um, identify it instead of um, shying away from it, hiding from it, pretending it isn't there, you know, really acknowledge that it's there. And once you acknowledge that it's there, then you can start doing the real work because it is a journey. It's not a one-time fix. Um, I, I don't feel myself healed. I feel like I'm healing and it's a process. Yeah. It's going to be a li lifelong process. So I think if we can change the mindset of, you know, it's not a one and done. You are a work in progress. Um, at least that's how I view my life. I'm a work in progress and, and you know, I'm, I'm going to, constantly be working on things that help me improve and heal. I love personal development. I love personal growth. I love, um, you know, just again, like you said, feeling empowered that um, it's up to me. Right. And I'm going to do it with compassion for myself. And you're, and you're enjoying, and you're enjoying the journey. I am. <laughs> Absolutely. And I love the people I'm meeting along the way. I love that. I just had an amazing conversation with a dear friend of mine named Chastin Miles. You will want to listen to that. He shares his journey, but also some amazing tips, amazing advice, just very nuts and bolts in it as well. Amazing. I think you'll love it. I like as far as Thank that you. journey goes. And then our friend Levi Lassick, he does a lot on um, how to build a YouTube empire as well from scratch. Is there anything like I may not have asked you're like, Bettina, I wish I really wish Bettina would have just like asked this question or said something. Is there anything like that, that you're like, mm, I would love to share this. You know, yes, thank you. Um, I would really say, um, find mentors, find coaches, uh, Find people that are already doing what you want to do. Um, for me, I found Brendan Burchard. And then, you know, I have this whole amazing community of individuals with Ultra. I'm also in other masterminds. But for me, that was such a game changer. And um, how I think of masterminds also shifted. I needed to up-level my relationships, my friendships. I needed to... Um, be comfortable with asking for help so that I could learn because if I don't ask for that help, then I can't in turn turn around and help others. Yeah, that is such a good lesson for everybody and for me. So thank you for sharing that. That is so true. And I'll agree this last, this journey that we've been on with Brendan has been instrumental. So thank I you. appreciate you. All right. I'll see you. Regina.